I, I have a lot of people asking me to come back to five leagues, but I really want to do five parsecs next because mm -hmm. it's fully solo and I haven't done a fully solo game in a while. Yeah, and yeah. I have a I have a huge amount of miniatures that I have painted in like the science fiction like bubblegum anime genre that I really want to use. Like I've I've been I've been dying to do like an infinity tabletop <laughs> RPG with miniatures for a long time. And so I think I'm oh, probably gonna, oh, yeah, yeah. gonna do that. Um if, if you had to pick though between the two, which is which is your favorite? Which do you like parsecs more or do you like five leagues more? <laughs> Put a that's gun to your head. What, which one do you like? Yeah, that's dangerous. Um, I think Leagues is the better design game, uh, but Parsecs Ooh. is like the one that's like in my heart. Um, like Parsecs was being able to sit down and do something that didn't quite exist and that I really, really wanted to exist. Um, I think that I think that I'm going to disagree and say I think that Five <laughs> Leagues is more is my more favorite one because yeah. you made me draw a map. <laughs> the the map the map drawing in that game is the most interesting and fun and creative thing. I actually drew my map and gave it to my patrons because I was like, "This yeah, is so yeah, fun!" Because yeah. I have this like emergent, uh, interesting place that I get to like design. It's funny because from the, the map. map was originally just kind of a throwaway. It was like we were talking about like, well, wouldn't it be cool if this was like an actual place you got to like fill in, develop? And, yeah, you put arts yeah. and crafts in your game. No, exactly. And then looking on like the Facebook group and stuff, like people are just really into like the first thing anyone will do after buying the book is they will make they will draw themselves a map and they'll put names Guilty. on it and stuff. No, absolutely. Yeah. And it's yeah. one of those things that like in hindsight, it's perfectly obvious. But like at the time it was just like, well, yeah, it would be kind of like I had originally the reason the travel mechanics are the way they are is because I wasn't sure people would want a map. So technically, you can write all your locations just on a piece of paper, and travel works the same because it's that's just, funny. Yeah. So, like, and again, well, like that's, it's you know, memorable. You're creating memorable moments, right? You're creating nothing no, but exactly. memorable moments. Right? I think that's the beautiful thing. So, yeah, it's just one of those See, things that, like, it's obvious in hindsight that that would be a hit with people, but sometimes you just stumble into doing it right. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, hey, everybody, welcome to their inside tabletop. We we've had a whole inside tabletop before I even did the intro, which is fantastic. Uh, I'm here once again with Ivan Sorensen. Say hi, Ivan. <laughs> Um, and you glad are, it's, it's, I'm glad to have you here. Um, we are following on from our previous week's conversation about the, 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 we had a, a conversation about getting started, about how do you get started designing or writing a game? And I think most of what we talked about actually would apply to almost any writing. Like it's just, it, so. it, it applies to game design too. Like there were some specific nuts and bolts in there too, but a lot of the like best practice stuff was like, how do you complete your first journey into writing? So what I wanted to talk to you about today was. How do you take that forward six, seven years later? Six, seven uh -huh. years is not a long time to be a full-time working like writer. And, right. and that's that's really impressive as a game designer. And you have almost 30 books in your catalog hosted in a variety of places because you've you've gone wide in that whole thing. And you've been published by Modifius with these lovely hardcovers uh, for both um, Five Parsecs and Five Leagues in the Borderlands. You can watch me play mm -hmm. Five Leagues in the Borderlands poorly, of course, in lots of my videos. Uh, it goes very badly in the beginning. We have to restart the Warband. <laughs> but when we restart the Warband, it's just to get a little bit better. Uh, and and it's funny because you just talked about how you, you stumble into good ideas that lead to further uh -huh. good ideas like that map making thing. So why don't you walk us through that? So you've, you've got your first game. Now let's go back in time to Little Ivan. You know, yeah. he's, he's just a just a fresh, rosy cheeked little schoolboy <laughs> getting ready to do his second game. What yeah. was the what was the, the we'll go into three stages here. What was stage one? You decide you're going to try and sell this. So mm -hmm. you make that leap. And then stage two is, oh, my God, it's working. How do you develop that? And then stage three mm -hmm. is I'm managing this now. So at stage one, what are your thoughts? How, how did you how did you get over the hump? And what are the like things people could avoid? Yeah, so the first that I had done, now I had got to cheat a little bit because before doing it commercially, I had done a sci-fi game called Fast and Dirty, which you'll occasionally see mentioned in like the pits of internet forums from back when like 15 millimeter science fiction was like an exciting new thing. <laughs> um, so we're, playing, we're all playing grunts and hammer slammers. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, before grunts uh, and contemporary with like the original chain reactions how far we're back oh, um, man. So, so i got a little bit of like cheating um because i had some experience like putting stuff out and like dealing with players uh but that was all done very sort of it kind of like stumbled together like as it went along because you know 
it was the first thing I was really like doing it. And that wasn't just with like friends who were, you know, too well disposed to tell me it was bad. Right. Um, the two nice so, tries to tell you that what you wrote was garbage. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, and it, it was always the sort of thing like, oh, that looks fun. We should play that some other time. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that you know that is a real thing though. That like that like kind of um, it's they're being nice because they like you, but then you can tell that they never have any intention of actually playing this. That is a emotional dagger that everyone yes, will get stabbed absolutely. with at some point. So, um, so. Once I had done, the first that was kind of like a commercial thing was Five Minute Normandy. And that sort of like caught people's attention because at the time, like um, this idea of like a pseudo RPG vibe in a World War II game wasn't much of a thing. Um, and it was small. So, it was small unit, too, which wasn't a big thing in, in World War II either. Yeah, I remember uh, the reason it's named that was because at the time there was kind of a joke that no matter what scale you aim a historical game at, people will try to like play double or triple that and then yeah. they'll complain, <laughs> complain the rules are grindy. So yeah. I, put, I was like, if I put in the title that it's five dudes, then there's no excuse for like, you can't up. screw this up. It's in the right. name. <laughs> <laughs> um, so after that sort of like started catching on and people were interested in the idea, um, I think that was kind of like the emotional fuel for like, okay, I could write other things and maybe people would be interested in that too. It was just kind of like a morale boost, if you will. Um, and at the time, my interests were more towards doing like historical stuff. So the second was uh, No End in Sight, which is like Cold War era um, skirmish mm -hmm. rules or platoon level. More, um, as a way of doing like a hard, like serious war game. Um, but I think going through the process of like putting it together, getting it up on Wargame Vault, um, I remember that the earnings I made from that, the first thing I purchased was a copy of uh, Chain of Command by uh, Two Fat Lardies. Because yeah. I felt like I, I had to like turn around and like put some of that money back into uh, into another company or another yeah. like developer. Uh, but seeing the process like actually play out, now there was like an idea like okay i have kind of a model for how i could do it um i knew that i didn't want to try to like crowdfund it again because that hadn't really gone anywhere um so i was just gonna like write the game show it off to some people that i knew who could test it and then but i knew like okay if i need to get it on wargame vault there are certain things i need to do um right it has to have a cover it has to have x y z to to get posted. yeah like the cover has to be like certain dimensions and so yeah. on so that started like establishing some of the process uh i had some basic idea like the layout in those books was real rough but i had a basic idea of like how to make games like the minimal amount of like readable and usable for people um and some of the feedback that were coming in like a lot of people were saying you know like they kept pdfs of games on their like tablet or ipad or whatever it's like oh, okay well in that case like that's why for a long time i stuck to single page layout to my own stuff because it's often easier on tablets um, so just getting some of those like process things in place so that, and then doing it like the next time and the next time, like those processes just kind of get easier. Cause you have like a systematic way. Like I can kind of like in my sleep walk through like putting something up on work involved and like writing the marketing blurb and it has to be emailed out here and it has to send an announcement there. And there has to be a thing, uh, you know, like you kind of just, um, make a routine out of those things, which takes a lot mm -hmm. of like the, the fret and worry out of those. Is that kind of that first realization that you have to be your own publisher? Because that's mm -hmm. all publisher job stuff. You know what I mean? Like if you yeah. had a publisher versus self-publishing, it's uh -huh. all of the like busy admin work that you yes. don't realize. Because I think that's, if I was doing Capsule, like what you just said, it's like, oh shit, I'm the publisher. Like I have mm -hmm. to source the art. I got to do the layout. I got to do the... The, the design of whatever the document's going to look like. I got to make sure it conforms to whatever these self-publishing or one bookshelf, you know, things are. And yeah. then I also have to write all the, all the, the boilerplate for it too. <laughs> like no, exactly. that is uh, mind numbing the first time. And then like you yeah. said, I'm, I'm sure it becomes more rote, but it's definitely yeah, something yeah. that you have to have sink in when you first start. Yeah. And I think for some of those steps, it's okay to just accept that you're going to be okay at it. And like, mm -hmm. if you can make it work, like um, I usually joke that I'm really bad at writing marketing blurbs because I just don't have like that mindset of like writing like captivating text that like lures you in to like go uh, open your wallet. Like, mm -hmm. um, that, like there's a reason that's like a job that people like go to college for, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. To be yeah to write, be writing, writing copy. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, what's, exactly. what's some um, of the small things you didn't realize at the beginning? Like one of the things that I always <laughs> forgot in the beginning was that I could chain the things together in these posts. So if I mm. write a supplement for something, I would forget to put in the description of it, referring back to the original rule book, right? Like just oh, little absolutely. things like that where you're like, oh, I put this thing up and you have this like assumed knowledge that, oh, because I know that the first thing exists, everyone else will. And it's like, no, no one cares about you. You're invisible. Oh, no one knows anything. No, that you absolutely. Do. Um, I have one or two cases where I put out like a supplement for something and I, my email that went out to like people in Wargame Vault didn't explain what game it was for. Right. So that's sort of the yardstick of like how bad you could be at this until you like realize because you get an email back from somebody say, that sounds great. Is this for X? Like, oh, get beat. No, uh, yes, it definitely it, is. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, a lot of those, especially if you're doing it on your own, and that's the thing if you are, um, like one of the things that helped me, I think, uh, turn it one, turn it into a business, and two, being able to continue doing it, was that I have always been like incredibly risk averse um, up to a point, anyway. So and like, so you can hire a dude to like do your layout for you, and it'll look way better because it's a dude who does layout, like that's their job. Or you can do it yourself. Now, the first option will look better, it'll flow better, it'll read better, and it will cost you, I don't know, you know, maybe that dude wants a thousand dollars to do that. So is that a thousand dollars you have when you're starting out? It might not be. Um, you can hire an artist to do a bunch of like beautiful art that really like get across the meaning and the point of your game and make it stand out and you'll draw in the people who won't buy a game that has a crap cover. And I'm sure you know how much art costs from like a good artist. That yeah. ain't cheap. Yeah, that's yeah, and, <laughs> and and I and I would not and I, well and, and the other thing too is like when you're in this indie sphere, you almost mm. feel like a commitment to operate with other people in that indie space with you. I know there's mm. a lot of people using AI generated art right now in in indie design, yeah. and and that and that's like a, I don't want to get into a thing about AI art, but like <laughs> that's a that is a thing that I feel people like goes very... against. People get very like emotional about that. They do, they do, um, they do. They like, do. Well, my 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 community sense. Mm. I always want to include other people trying to also make a go of it in what I do. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's where like I come at it. It's it's not that I think there's like a, I don't have a value judgment on it. It's that it doesn't fit with what I'm always trying to accomplish when I do this stuff. And I work with some incredible artists. Um, yeah. In like my project with Osprey and stuff like that that I'm super proud mm. of. Uh, oh, absolutely. I know that like, and, and, and I know that other, other writers too, like Joe's uh, Joe's work with Barrett Stanley on Rangers. They have mm -hmm. this like unique partnership now together, right? Where yeah, it's yeah. like, Oh, look at these two guys that are cooperating and they've elevated each other by doing mm -hmm. all this stuff. So I, I kind of come at it that way. Um, yeah, what's your, um, what's your, what's your sourcing for art usually? How do you find an artist? If you do decide to find an artist, where do you go to? So, uh, the people I've used in the past, uh, not counting like, uh, Leaks and parsecs because I didn't have to handle any of that. I just sure, got to yeah, tell yeah, the artist, uh, tell the artist what I would like, and then they went and did it. And it was magic, and it was amazing. Um, that is the publisher you, bonus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, uh, but usually, I just I had a couple of times where I've just like literally asked online. Uh, I realized, by the way, that if you put like a post on like Twitter or something saying you're looking for an artist, you will have a thousand messages in your inbox. Um, you sure will. Yeah. Uh, so well, everybody's everybody's big, fighting. Oh God, yeah, those dudes are hungry. Um, but I've mostly like tried to find people that I enjoyed and knew how to work with well, and then just kind of kept with them. Uh, like a lot of early stuff was uh, this guy from Italy, uh, Luigi. I'm gonna mess up the name Castellani or something like that. He's done a bunch of like bigger stuff since. Uh, but we just, I had taken him on. I don't even remember the first thing he did for me. Uh, it was just like a little small thing. Uh, but he had a sense of like I could give him very general directions and he would go and create something and mm -hmm. we had this kind of understanding of it that like I wasn't gonna like super impose like very strict things I think it's important in a lot of cases that the artist gets to like you can tell the artist and their personality in it and that's really just interesting like, sorry go ahead mm -hmm. yeah I was gonna say um we were just kind of on the same page with it. So he would come back with something that was like what I had asked for, but it was also not exactly what I had asked for, but in a good way. And it's like, okay, mm -hmm. this is, yeah, you know, they'll, they'll go, and, they'll go, they'll go to places you can't <laughs> anticipate that actually elevates it. Yeah. Um, and like, sure. If you're commissioning, like for something that is ultra specific, you know, you have to like be more specific with that. Um, mm -hmm. Well, when you're first starting out though, I think, I think what you make is a really interesting point though, that, 
There are people out there in the art world that are in the same position as you trying to break in. And if yes. you can collaborate with those people, you don't need to be intimidated about a price. Like there will be people who might contact you with a crazy price tag and you're like, oh my God, I could never do this. This is just like a thing I'm trying to do right now. Mm. But there's also people that are gonna be like, hey, can we work out something? Because I've never done what you're doing either. And yeah. I'd like to work with um, you for the first time. And you get these like really cool working partnerships that way. I think part of it too is also just uh, to get over being intimidated by it. Cause I've had the same experience mm. of like, I don't want to ask this person cause they're going to say like $500 and I'm going to offer them like 150. But like, yep. that's just like, you know, like nobody is intimidated going into like the grocery store and seeing how much a pizza costs. And it's the same thing. Like if they say that the price is like something you can't do, like just thank them and keep them on, you know, maybe someday you can't afford that or that's the right It's the worst the part for creative people having to do adult decision-making, right? Like, yes, absolutely. When you, it's like, it, you're like, oh God, I have to have a confrontation about this now. And I am, yeah. I am used to sitting in front of my computer. I don't want to do this. <laughs> right. And all you need to do is say like, okay, that's outside my budget, but I'll bear in mind. Thank you. You know? Like, yeah. I, well, I, I, I've got so many scripted terms now. We're like, I'm so sorry. That doesn't work for my budget. Or I'm so sorry. That doesn't, that doesn't, that doesn't work for my vision. Or like yeah, yeah, you yeah. kind of, you kind of learn over time how to be like respectful and tasteful and, you know, thank yeah. them for their like inquiring and stuff like that. But you do it. I think you're right. You do need to get over that intimidation part of all mm -hmm. of the businessy side stuff that you need, even just to establish your first thing. Yeah. into a marketplace, right? There's going to be a, a number of steps you have to take to do that. So so now right. imagine you're in the marketplace, you've successfully hung your shingle and you've mm. got like three or four things. You're in that mid range now. Yeah. What What are some of the things you would want to go back and tell yourself about like, oh, I'm starting to make money doing this. Like how, mm. do, what do I do with that? <laughs> right. So one of the things that uh, will come up very quickly, I think, is time management. Because I think anyone, there's always this idea that if you're like a small business person, and you kind of are when you're creating things, uh, then like you should be spending like a thousand hours every day like doing that. And if you do that, you will probably have an alcohol problem. Die. Yeah, yeah you will. It'll, it'll be terrible. <laughs> uh, so you have to like start parceling out. Like, if I have to spend serious time on this, and serious time we have this like idea because most jobs are, like 37 or 40 hours a week, but that's mm -hmm. what a serious thing takes. But that's not necessarily the case. Like some people work 50 hours a week and some work, you know, 20, it just depends on what you do. Um, but you have to like start thinking serious about what does this look like for a time commitment? Like, can you tell like your partner that I can't like go to the park today because I have to work on this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, this even is a though job. You could, yeah. Even though like you could write at any time, but, you know, can you, uh, is the question. Um, I find that people in my life started to respect that, that like structure for me uh -huh. when I made that a priority, like, and that's a hard mental shift is if it's starting to become a business, you yeah. have to be really clear with people. Like, I know that this used to be a thing I did for fun. I'm <clears> working <throat> now. Like I'm actually at work right now. So, or I need to go work. And I know it yeah, looks like fun, um, but it's start. It's 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 a it's a real like conversation you have to have with yourself too about like no, I need yeah. to treat this like it's a job now. People will respect it as much as you respect yourself, and I want to be Absolutely. clear just just in case my wife watches this later, is that she's always been amazingly supportive. So this, this isn't throwing shade. <laughs> no, 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 of course not. <laughs> our our character is not comfortable. However. Um, yeah, it is like as much as you respected yourself. Um, one thing I used to hate uh, is because if you talk to any person who's not a gamer, they will have no idea what you do for a living. How do you describe uh, this? I, how do I describe any of this, Ivan? I have no idea. Right, how do I describe no, exactly. what I do? And I would like be at like a, a thing with a kid and some dude would come up and just, you know, he's bored because it's a kid's birthday party. Uh, and when I was like, hey, what do you do for a living? And you say you write things on the internet and like the the look you often get, like if you told people you were just collecting bottles and doing heroin, they would probably have like respected that more because people just don't have any like conception of it. And it's easy to get into that mindset of like, well, maybe it is kind of dumb and like, and you just have to like treat imposter it as syndrome. Yeah. Yeah. I think that is mm -hmm. the outgrowth of imposter syndrome. The, the, yeah. if, if the, if the getting finished your first thing was the hurdle from our last video, I think mm -hmm. the hurdle is all internal in this one for me. And it's yes. getting over the idea that, no, this is actually real. Like this is, yeah. if, if you, if you minimize it to yourself and then minimize mm -hmm. it to others, you will always have that feeling forever. But if yes. you be excited about it 
and and evangelize it, people will just mm. get excited with you, even if they have no idea what you're talking about. But no, you're absolutely. putting that judgment almost out there when you try and yes. minimize or, or make it not make sense what you do. Oh, absolutely. And you'll see a lot when pe somebody pops up on like RPG Net or something, they're talking about like how they just made their first game and they're putting it out and they're really sorry, but they are going to ask for $2 for like this book or whatever. And like, and you're just, you're basically asking people to like not like it because you're kind of trying to like defend yourself that like oh mm -hmm. maybe this is pretty bad maybe i you know uh and part of it yeah it's getting over that feeling and i think a lot of it is just becoming a little mercenary with it like um it's self-worth i think it's self-worth you have to know what your time is worth mm. right like oh, absolutely i will say i will say no to tons of things mm. because it's not it's not worth it to me like i know what the the value i bring to stuff is oh yeah and if this that value is value's a, not commensurate then that's that's a whole internal conversation right oh god yeah and like everyone i know who's like an artist or they do layout or anything like that they run into that constantly because other people will not value your time unless you make them value it it's and a whole meme on the internet what's that song <laughs> it costs as much because it takes me fucking hours <laughs> <laughs> it costs as much because i don't have superpowers i love i yeah, love yeah, that yeah. song that no, I've absolutely. never had a me a real like speak to me ever as much as that uh, as that <laughs> one did because it's it's just true like somebody no, made absolutely. that thing yeah uh, so I think a lot of it is you know just changing a mindset to it and again uh, we talked about this uh, in the last episode that you don't have to go there if that's not what you want to do uh, but mm -hmm. if you do want to publish games as a job and like that is what you want to put your time and sweat and energy into you kind of have to do it you know what i mean mm -hmm. you like have to you don like a, a you have to put on some like cloak of invulnerability to go into that marketplace and be like nope this is what it's worth to me this is what i want to get back for it and right. um, and and all the comments to to say otherwise well then you go right. write that thing if you want it for cheaper go make it for yourself <laughs> yes uh but you don't put that on the forum you just oh, i do i do i i will absolutely <laughs> say that to people that's fair um <laughs> The truth of it, um, I have often said in the past that like money is made up and everything costs what we just agree that it costs. Yep. Uh, because no matter what you charge for something, there's somebody who won't pay that much and there's another dude who would pay more. Yep, absolutely. So you yeah, just that's, have to kinda... that's really, that's super important, I think. That is such mm. a, an interesting observation. You, 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 you almost always are susceptible to believing the last thing you've been told. And never, yeah. and never, and never consider that someone else out there thinks the opposite too, that you just haven't mm -hmm. heard that yet. Yeah. And I think it's also, I mean, obviously there is a little bit of price pressure, like uh, what $20 buys you from an RPG book is different than what it buys you from a war game book. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so you have to know the market a little bit. Uh, but the funny thing is when I did, this didn't do all that well, but it did a little, um, an RPG thing called Dreams of Dragons. And I priced it the way I would have priced it as a uh, war game, uh, which was about, tw at the time, I think it was like 100 pages and I priced about 20 bucks, uh, which is more than people would charge for a 100 page RPG. RPG with, book, yeah. Yeah, and especially one that looked a little gorilla and had like photos of miniatures instead of art. But nobody complained about the price. Now it's almost guaranteed there are people who didn't pick it up because it looked a little too jank for that price. But in the end, like the people who were interested in it picked it up and I got some positive emails about it. Yeah. Um, so you just have to, especially there's always this idea of like undervaluing yourself because you're either uncertain or you're trying to like compete on price. But nobody in the end, when somebody's sitting on the gaming table, nobody's going to say, man, I am glad I only paid four ninety nine. If I had paid seven dollars, I would have been having a terrible time playing this game. Like that's mm -hmm. not a thing. Like, mm -hmm. so you have to kind of have a little, and you can always adjust the price later, you know, like if they find that, yeah, that was charging a hundred dollars for a one page RPG is probably not going to be a profitable. And you can run path. sales. You can test it up by running sales too. You can be like, I wonder if anyone will buy it if it's this much and they do. And you're like, uh -huh. oh, okay, it just costs 5% more than this much now when I, when yeah, I yeah, price yeah. it. Um, one thing that is really weird, and I gave up trying to understand it, but I realized when I put stuff out for free uh, versus if I charge a dollar, even if it's like a beta draft or like an early version, um, charging the dollar got way better feedback and way more feedback than if I put it out for free. Um, yeah. I don't know if it's just like the mental investment that people have committed a dollar, and now this is worth at least as much as a cup of ramen, so we should put some thought into it 100%. or what it is.
Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it, well, it I think happen. I think I think value is reciprocal. If you value mm -hmm. what you put out there, people will value it enough to engage with you over it. Whereas if something's free, they'll throw it away. Like they won't even. Think yeah, about it again. I think there's a feeling uh, that it, or like pay what you want. I know like RPG circles are very fond of pay what you want, and maybe the market is different there. Uh, but the thing is, especially for uh, miniatures gamers, there's kind of an idea that if it's just something you download for free, it's probably not going to be that great. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes that's unfair because there's some really nice like free games out there. And um, I think that's changing over time because almost every mass market publisher mm -hmm. now has their shit up on all the major places. Like yeah. you can buy, you can buy, you can buy every Osprey book forever. You can buy all of yeah. the Diffia stuff forever. <laughs> any, any like mm -hmm. D and D stuff. It's all up there forever now uh, yeah. in, in digital format. Right. So, because it's just free <laughs> money. Like if you just hang up your InDesign files and, Oh yeah, yeah. You just make free money forever if it's sitting there. Yeah. Someone's going to want it in in a digital format. No, absolutely. Uh, and that's kind of the other thing you have to like make peace with is that you're going to be competing uh, against not just like other indie authors. Like when it comes to the choice of how somebody's going to spend their gaming time, you're competing with Games Workshop or Wizards of the Coast. That doesn't mean that your game is competition to them. They don't <laughs> know you exist, and they never will. But you have to kind of like make your peace that like, yeah, on one hand, you're sort of like fighting the 10,000 ton gorilla. On the other hand, you kind of aren't and you can carve out your own little space. Uh, but it's kind so of a weird. That's, like I was going to say, that's funny because that is the conversation we had last time a little bit where now you need to start to manage your relationship with your customers. And you don't necessarily mm -hmm. have to do that in the beginning, but in that mm -hmm. middle section, you need to establish like a relationship basically with them to get them to, mm. to check out your next thing. And, mm. and there was all kinds of like avenues for that. You have a discord, right? You have Facebook, like yeah. anyone can start that stuff. It's available to everybody. Mm -hmm. There is an interesting uh, point I heard. Um, I forget what podcast I was listening to, but they were mentioning uh, for a lot of young authors, uh, they spend a lot of time and effort building up like a social media following, uh, but they don't have a book to fear. Yeah. <laughs> and it's easy to like funny. Uh, no it is and it's totally because we are so wired into and part of it i think is that if you're kind of like a digital native like you grew up maybe as the generation after you you and mine um you know being on the internet and everything being tied to social media is kind of natural that's just the way like life works right mm -hmm. um so it's easy to look at that and spend a lot of time on that and say, I need to do all this before I can do X, which is write my game or write my book. But, you know, like the point is pretty obvious. Like if you don't have anything to share, like Twitter likes or whatever, or Facebook shares are not going to like pay your bills. And they're not really yeah. going to like help you out like yourself with it either. As it turns to, like, into it turns into that South Park where it's like, don't worry, the pizza's coming. The pizza's coming. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. the it's the it's the Game of Thrones South Park where it's like, don't worry, the pizza's gonna be here soon. And that <laughs> and that like obsession with being good enough social media wise to merit doing the thing that you've promised to do. That's yeah. like I guarantee that's a trap. Yeah, that you and I have avoided oh, just because we didn't know it was there. I think we have the opposite trap where we undervalue the social media. Where I think people oh, that grew up in um, the digital space overvalue it. No, absolutely. Um, I saw the long, um, I went through a thing the last couple of years where I kind of pulled back from like almost all social media because uh, I was just like sick and tired of it. Uh, but of course, you're going to lose out on a lot of things too because again, like people buy indie games especially because they want to have a connection, and sometimes they just mm -hmm. appreciate the idea that they can like ask on Facebook. Like a lot of people on the like Five Parsecs Facebook group are like surprised that like I'll answer rules questions there. Uh, yeah, that's not something they expect. So, so, and that's just a really little thing, but you know, that goes a long way to people. They feel like, oh, there is like a connection to this thing. So you have to like balance that out. Uh, you can't mm -hmm. like hide away from all of it, but I think it's also easy to like overvalue that compared to, it's like the old thing of like, what is your like actual job, you know, yeah. and your actual well, job what's your at the end of the core day business. Is, yeah, like your job is to make games and sit at a keyboard. <laughs> you yeah, know? no, you don't get paid when someone likes one of your posts. You get paid when someone buys one of your games. And one can help lead to the other, but there needs to be games there for them yeah. to buy. And that's funny because that's the that's the next, I guess, final, you've achieved your final form. You mm. don't just have a stable of individual one-off games. You have interrelated material. And like mm -hmm. that allows you to re- 
to basically re-release the core rulebook every time you do that. That's a, a thing I think people don't realize is every supplement for, for a game sells the mm -hmm. original rulebook a whole bunch of times. Can you talk about oh, that yeah. a little bit? Like when you start oh, actually absolutely. thinking about that, like I want to sell yeah. more of um, X. So the two things to kind of take on board there is the first thing is that things will cross sell each other uh, and often like weird, unpredictable ways. I usually joke that like whenever I put something up for release, the absolute first sales notification I'll get from like drive through is not that book. Yeah. Um, and I think it's like somebody who had it in their like wish list and they see like an email go out and like, oh, I meant to buy this other thing. I'll go do that now. Um, but having establishing a catalog with things that are they don't have to be that closely related either um obviously will like everything you do will help promote and sell everything else you do because you'll get people yeah. who are like well this thing was kind of cool i want to see like what else like oh here's a game about like uh spaceships or whatever i'm gonna pick that up yeah um so i think that's a thing that a lot of times people start off with they have like the one idea um and that idea may be great but it probably isn't gonna like be a sustainable long-term business like even everything is diminishing are... returns all, all even the greatest rule book ever written has a diminishing return of you've, mm -hmm. you've you've captured the viewpoint and there's you you also have a churn in this marketplace where there is stuff piling up on top of the stuff you've released that's oh, yeah. that's gonna gonna be over top of yours and yours is just gonna disappear to the bottom of the pile so you right. almost have to tread water and push your own catalog up every time you post something yeah, that's very true. Um, and you also run into, especially for um, if you mostly are doing just one idea and variations of it. Um, and there's some, like some people are very bought into the idea that they have like a family of games. And if you learn how to play this one, you can then play that and that and that. Um, so there's nothing wrong with like cashing on that a little bit. But I think if you do that like exclusively, um, you end up like painting yourself into a corner because at some point that will just kind of like have burned itself out and people are mostly moving on from that or it ends up being so like self-referential that is actually kind of difficult for people to like get into and you hate writing um, it because you're just you, you're right you start to write it's the marvel movie syndrome right <laughs> where you can't you can't make the same movies forever right and, and there's nothing oh, you can chase down a rabbit hole forever and it all eventually has diminishing returns so it's good in the outset because you can rebrand and mm -hmm. relaunch but then at some point you have to like I think just as a creative person, you have to feel compelled to write something different just to see if you can, just to no, keep absolutely. that like energy and intention forward to, to go and do yeah. it. Yeah. Um, the other thing, and this is something that took a long time, um, marketing people talk about uh, revealed preferences, which is that you have to look at what people actually do and not what they say they want to do. Like mm -hmm. the classic example is like, if you ask people what kind of coffee they like, they will say that they like like a dark roast because that's what sounds like the more sophisticated coffee drinker. Right. But if you go to like, look at what sells at the store, it's like the bland, like light one. They're like, that's what we buy. <laughs> you know, I'm not. Um, and like, if you ask people, like, do they want like supplements or games? They will, a lot of people, especially war gamers will say that they don't, they want like one big comprehensive book and everything in and they don't have to buy the one book. But if you actually do that, because I've tried like every possible permutation of this, then people will start complaining that there's no support for the game or it's dying or it's abandoned or they just lose interest. Yeah. Like publishing supplements for a game absolutely will increase the overall sales of like that game. That like, pillar basically of your, of your, your yeah. Product line. Um, and you can like, yes. Um, Cause I've done, um, it's one of those funny things. Cause like I've done games where I d just did like one expansion. Cause there was just, there was a few X ideas and, you know, they weren't really meant for the core book or they didn't really fit there. Uh, or or it completes the theme. Like I, that was what I was with last days. I had, I had mm -hmm. two big ideas. They yeah, didn't yeah. need to go together. And so the core rule book is what if all the zombie movies I'd ever watched were a game. And then the second right. one was what if a T a, a TV anthology series of zombie movies was the game. So like one is the one off yeah, yeah. movie. The other one is, the actual like anthology of like, no, it's dawn day. You know, it's, it's that yeah, night yeah, dawn yeah. day, like that idea of like them going forward into each other. Yeah. Um, and I think, uh, so with like, um, the original Parsex when it was an indie thing, um, I put out like a ton of extra material cause I was just kind of on a groove or like, it's really fun and simple to create for. Um, and like both of those versions will get you like different people who are not happy with that. Because uh, group one wants a lot of expansion coming out all the time. Group two uh, can feel overwhelmed and they lose track of it. And they want like just a couple of like large books. So I think you have to understand that you have to like produce stuff and you have to support your work. Uh, 
but past that point, I think you just kind of have to like pick an option and go with it. And you can go back and change that option when you do a different game, try out different things. It's maybe your specific audience wants fewer but beefier books, and maybe a different audience wants just quick little things and new army lists and new scenarios and stuff like that. Do you ever find um, that you feel comp you feel pressured? to incorporate your next cool idea into your successful system versus starting something new. Cause there's like uh, a, there's kind of like a, there's kind of like an allow, like a, a pull to that where it's like, Oh, I have this really cool idea. I guess I could fit it in this thing. that's already successful or I could try something different. Cause I feel like that's um, where like, that's where like the creative management at the end comes in where you're like, you have to decide yeah. if you're going to go wide or deep, right? Like wide is right. more different games. Like, deep is keep going deep into the same thing. Yeah. Um, I tend to, if it, if I'm left to my own devices, I tend to push fairly radical ideas out to the next thing or a different thing. Yeah. Um, I like having this idea that each game sort of has this like bubble of ideas that are suitable for it and ideas that aren't suitable. And it depends a little bit on the game because some games you can experiment a lot and it's still kind of feel the same. Others, it just won't fit. Uh, and I don't like trying to make it fit. Uh, what will pull you that way, though, is whatever the audience is, because most people, uh, you and me included, we don't necessarily know that we want something until we are told and shown that we can have it. Yeah, I want to like, be surprised and delighted. I, I actively try not to want anything because that way I get to be like excited <laughs> no, about exactly. it when something shows up that I haven't, I haven't expected. Yeah, uh, but if you ask people, they will usually just default to like a variation of what they have themselves. Right. Um, so like a lot, especially now with like parsecs and leagues being, you don't know, big and kind of like a little bit of zeitgeist right now, like people, the first thing, like anyone will say like, okay, this, but X, like this, but Cowboys or this, but mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Um, and I'm, and sometimes you're have to sit and think about it. Like, well, I wouldn't mind doing a cowboy game, but I don't think this is the right uh, choice for it. Um, so it's easy to get, like, get pulled into that because I can guarantee like, if I did like a cowboy game like that, there would be an audience who would immediately pick it up. Um, so sometimes you have to like, you know, balance it out a little bit. Uh, I don't think, I don't want to say like, it's bad to listen to like what the fans the audience want because obviously you have to do that some of the time, but you also have to kind of like have your own voice for it because otherwise you just end up like uh, being work for hire essentially. Yeah. And you're chasing, you're, you're trying to shoehorn. I'm never more bored with a project than if I feel like I'm, mm. I'm shoehorning something into something I don't super want to do. And there's yes. a point where like, I'm willing to walk away and be like, mm -hmm. nope, that was what I wanted to make. I'm good with it. When I get, when I feel the pull to make the next thing, that's when I'll make the next thing. And, yes, and that, 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 that like, that like, uh, that's the experiential stuff. I think when you get to the late stage where you're at, where you've got this big body of work, it's, mm -hmm. It's, and it's funny cause you, it's not, you, you haven't overcome all of the other things that were your impediments. You've scaffolded yourself with all the techniques you've learned and the skills and stuff, yeah, yeah. but you're now presented with this new problem of, of managing it, right? You have to manage right. this, this, not just the ideas in your head, but then all the stuff that it's going to like web into and interconnect with. And even mm -hmm. like, cause I, it's funny when you said, uh, X game and in, in Y setting might not work. Do you ever get that sense that like, oh, I don't know where anyone would get models for this. So then you just don't write it. Like, cause in the indie sphere, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of like mm -hmm. one, I think that's one of the joys of like the miniature agnostic gaming where people get to be on the very edge of creativity and go like, no, I'm going to mm -hmm. make this from scratch. But two, as a designer, you're kind of like, where the hell would they even get this? Where would you get <laughs> yeah. cat robots? Like, where would you, right. like, cause you're trying um, to pair up the physical and the, and the rules. Yeah. So I starting out, um, like there's a reason all the races in five parsecs are like sci-fi arch types. Uh, one, because yeah. I kind of wanted, I thought it would be fun to do that. But the second one was if you tell people that you need like not Klingons and not Eldar, people could go out and like pick models of that pretty easily. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there was a lot of like parceling that in. Like, and at the time, my stance on it was that like if I'm writing a uh, figure agnostic game, my purpose is to get the rules to you so that it's as easy for you to play as possible. So at the time, I was kind of shying away from the idea of like putting something really weird so that you have to go like make or build or find a weird model because I felt that was like over overstepping a bound, I guess. Um, conversely, and I kind of changed my opinion on that. And I think part of that is just like confidence and like having a degree of captive audience. But I think I also realized that, especially with the rise of some of the more figure oriented projects like Inquisitor 28 and like, uh, like the turnip stuff and all that stuff. 
mm-hmm. where people were willing to just build models for a game. Like, because a lot of those are requesting stuff that like literally doesn't exist and people yeah. were into it. And that's, that's a challenge. Some people rise to that. Some people crave that. Like, oh, how oh, do absolutely. I do this? Yeah. Uh, so it's a way of like keying into and in part, like anything you make is always going to reflect like your own bias, your own flaws, and your own strengths. Uh, I am a very bad modeler and an okay at best painter on a great day. Uh, so the idea of pushing something that was like specifically aiming at like modeling and painting just didn't really appeal and didn't occur to me because those are not areas I'm good at. Um, so I wouldn't, I didn't write a game that would be something that I wouldn't find that great either. But then over time, like I said, I realized that there is that other audience that really burns to that. So with like with leagues, um, a lot of people comment on like the fantasy race are like really weird. Um, and that was partially intentional to get people kind of out of their comfort zone a little bit and go mm-hmm. like, look at, you know, here's a weird model. Like one of the fun things is like the Duskling race, which is like the barbarian race. And they're like, all the descriptions are very kind of vague and the art is very vague. Uh, and people will come up with all kinds of stuff because you'll get people who are like, oh, okay, that's obviously like a Conan barbarian. So I'm going to get like a muscle man in the speedo. And other people are like that is obviously an orc. So I'm gonna buy some like Warhammer orcs. And use some I interpreted like, as I interpreted as Gith Yankee. That's what I had. I had like yeah, a, a see, Gith Yankee thing in my head where they were like these like <laughs> they were like corrupted elf pseudo hobgoblin. Yeah, like weird warriors, um, right? Like one one person said that he was just gonna play them as dwarves because the rules made the most sense for a dwarf for that. Yep. Uh, and that was so like interesting uh, to see people be able to do that and it has a really powerful like effect because now that player has made like a choice. Like this is my dust coin. He's going to be a little different from like what he's like in any other game. Um, and that's something that like, I think if I'd realized like sooner, I would definitely have like embraced that a lot more. Um, what? So that's funny. Cause you, you have gone two paths in your catalog. One of the mm-hmm. paths is based on something that exists, right? Mm-hmm. Like there's things that exist. And the other path is I am going to not, I'm not going to overly define what this is. So you guys can bring whatever it is you want into it. Can mm-hmm. you talk more about that? Cause I think that's really interesting. Cause like the world war two stuff obviously is steeped in world war two. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. the, the sci-fi and fantasy stuff though is very intentionally about giving vibes, but mm-hmm. not requirements. You're not making <laughs> people do a thing. And I think yeah. that's such an interesting dance for you. Cause that's, that makes you more marketable. There's a real intentionality to doing that. Like you said, mm-hmm that makes it so that everybody approaches it in their own way and, uh-huh. and, and gets their own experience out of it. And that's a, that, yeah. that's a, that seems like it's intentional for you. It is intentional. Um, but that's something that is, it takes definitely some like effort because like anything you put in the book is, will pull that line like w- a little bit closer to one way or the other. If I say that like a specific weapon works in a certain way, that pulls a tiny bit more towards like, okay, like five parsecs is like a specific setting that works like yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, the author, the author voice has so much power. You have to be care- You have to really manage it. Yeah. Um, honestly, like the two big motivations for what I wanted the settings to look like was, uh, in part, like one of the big motivations was that I wanted, I think everyone who like creates something like this, they kind of have this idea, um, that they want to like show the world all the things they thought were cool. Right. You know, like if you read like the original like Warhammer Forty Thousand Rogue Trader, it's it's that you know, like yeah. you can tell how many like two thousand AD comics those guys read. Yeah, yeah, hundred uh, percent. Oh, it's the whole thing is just married in jokes. Like the whole thing is right. Re- like it's it's so mm-hmm. reference heavy. You couldn't do it today. Like that's the no, funny exactly. thing is it it ha- you the only way you can get away is by saying it's parody. And if it was yeah. parody back then, it's not parody now, right? So like <laughs> you you have to you have to like. Yeah, you have to, like, ride that line. Yeah. Uh, So part of it was wanting to do the same thing, but for my generation, basically. Because, like, um, everyone that I, like, looked up to, and I was a super nerd, so I looked up to game designers, but they all grew up in, like, the 70s. or they So they're talking about, like, their experience in, like, Thatcher's England, or they're talking about their experiences reading, like, sword and sorcery novels that had already been like disappeared from the yeah, library robert e. I, howard and yeah all that stuff. yeah like i never saw a conan book at our library when i was a kid we had a great fantasy section today but just that was old no they would have burned them because the they would have burned them because the frank frazetta covers were too racy they were too like <laughs> well, they were too, too much too much scantily clad so. people oh you were fine then yeah if you're in denver yeah, yeah. 
Like, you, can, we you, can, some... you can show that amount of skin on a on a book cover. You'd be fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But they were just like old, and that stuff had gone by. Like yeah. you know, like a lot of the uh, OSR writers will talk about like Appendix N books and stuff like that. Yeah, and like yeah. ninety nine percent of those I read as an adult because they were just not around. Um, so I have that experience of like. Um, and that becomes very foundational. Like you can, especially for like sci-fi miniatures game, you can kind of count off a very small list of influences, like Star Wars and Aliens and Blade Runner and like Hammer Slammers, I suppose. And it gets real thin after that. Like everyone mm-hmm. lists the same stuff. Yeah. And I had this like um, not alienating, but I always had this feeling that like I engaged with some of that stuff, but there was also a lot of stuff that formed what I thought about science fiction that was not any of that stuff at all. You know, like. Um, which is like, if you ever looked at like the inspiration section, like the Parsex book, you know, it's referencing like the Borderlands video games or Mass Effect or like the Trigon anime. Yeah. Uh, and some of those were not foundational when I was a kid, because most of those are things that came out when I was, you know, a teenager or an adult. Um, but they're just the influences I took into what I thought was cool in sci-fi. And then there's like random old video games. Like there's a lot, you know, Mass Effect, obviously, but also old like, uh, Commodore era, like uh, computer games and stuff that nobody remembers. Like nobody remembers like Alien Breed or Hired Guns. Mm-hmm. But I played those when I was like twelve, and they like blew my mind. And they, that's and like, that's well, it's funny because that's that's such a valuable like final piece of insight. I think is that mm-hmm. you find your your inspiration doesn't have to come from games. Your inspiration mm-hmm. comes from everything that you absorb. Like you and I had a conversation about this album. It's behind yes. me here in the, in the photo um, <laughs> where we were talking about music because you and I have a shared love of music. And yeah. I was like, oh, yeah, I had this thing where I wrote an entire campaign for Joseph McCullough's <laughs> Frostgrave. There was just there was yeah. just the, uh, one of the songs on this album. And it's like and it's like it, it's it, and then I got all of these wonderful bits of feedback from the people that played the game of like, ah, it's a rep- I get I get what you did there. Yeah, I see yeah. the thing. And, it, and it, it's not it's not derivative at that point. It's just that's the soundtrack now to this three mission little mini campaign. And oh, and you can find you can find that anywhere. And that to me is, and this is my final question before we tie this up, how mm-hmm. do you keep going? How do you, how do you find it? Cause just fa- if we, in the first video, we talked about how just getting done a project is like this exercise mm-hmm. in stamina. How do you keep finding inspiration? Where do you go? Cause obviously I'm surrounded by media that I love. And mm-hmm. that's where I draw all my inspiration from. I do a, I do a series of like, um, little free writing things for my patrons, uh, called film mm-hmm. the table or, or, or book to table or whatever the, the end up, the thing's going to be where it's, it's, I get inspired by something and I pick a game and I mash them together and I write something. But yeah, yeah. what about you? How do you, how, like, if you feel that in your head, how do you capture mm-hmm. it so that it's there as like your next kind of like jumping off point? Yeah, I think part of it is, I think inspirations are really important. Uh, for me, honestly, uh, and you may appreciate this, uh, music is always a really like big inspiration for me. Yeah, Just like listening, because it's a way of getting visions and ideas um, that are emotional without necessarily being logical. Uh, like there's a lot of, especially if you listen to like um, a lot of metal, there's a lot of stuff that is kind of nonsense, but it still like resonates emotionally with you. And I think that's really important for just like, fueling like this idea you know like i was listening to uh, a band called dune dvne they do sort of like soundscapey weird yeah, yeah. esoteric stuff and like it is really like emotionally powerful and i don't think i can make out like a single word that the dude is singing it, it just doesn't matter so i think having like inspirations flow into you and just like exposing yourself to, like creative stuff um the other thing ironically is that i tend to be very, very like sparse with um, games that are like too close to what I do. Um, mm. Like most of my personal like tabletop miniatures gaming is like historicals, and I do write historical gaming, and I'm working on one right now. But when I'm doing like a lot of like five parsex work, like um, for Modiphius right now, I find that one I tend to just get kind of overwhelmed, like over it a little bit if I'm then also playing like a bunch of Warhammer 40k or something. Uh, and right. two, I find that I start taking ideas from other games. And that sounds like really snooty. But for me, um, the results are always better and clearer when I go to some sort of like inspirational material instead. So if I'm writing a new science fiction game, I sit down and like I find some science fiction movies I haven't watched. I sit down and watch those. Or I find some 
um, music that is sort of space themed. I listen to that or I read a book, um, you know, but what I will not do is sit down and play a bunch of other like sci-fi skirmish games or spaceship games or something. Cause no. it just, it puts it, you in a mindset. It taints the where well. You, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and the same goes, you know, if I'm working on like a world war two game, I don't read world war two rule books. I'll pick up, you know, a history book or a board game or something, but yeah. Getting enough separation, I think, actually, like, helps. The other thing I'll do sometimes is I like to do this sort of, like, total immersion where if I'm, like, really into, like, creating something, I will kind of go overboard. So, like, um, I've been working on, like, a World War One project. So I had, like, a period where, like, I was only listening to bands that had like albums that were theme albums about that. I was right, only right. like, yeah, well, yeah. you know, you just go like completely. You immerse like, yourself in the vibe sort of. So you can like, you can put yourself in it. You can write mechanics yeah. that make you think of the feeling mm -hmm. of what's happening and they're evocative and stuff like that. There's a lot of, it's funny cause you, you do, that's, that's not just inspiration at that point. Dude. That's just drawing energy. You know what I mean? From yeah, that exactly. stuff to, to get it done and, and to keep the, to keep your eye on the target. I think it's really mm -hmm. easy when you write a big long form thing like a game to get untethered from like the goal or the objective or like the 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 tone poem you're trying to paint. Oh, absolutely. And um, and that that's that's where like I think you, you know if you keep swimming in the the feeling of that yeah. like well what am I trying to present here? You can keep your eye on that target and you can keep yourself like flying towards it. No, absolutely. Um so I think doing things like that can help you get going the other part is you just have to kind of like be in love with the process of like creating and i think there's we've talked about the imposter syndrome but i think you also have to temper that with the flip side which is like boundless arrogance as a writer yeah. Yeah. like if you're going to create things and put it out there at some point you do have to kind of believe that you're the smartest guy in the room and you're the only one who's figured this stuff out or you that know, my vision rationally. or that yeah or that i've or that i've like i've completed my vision like regardless of what you think about it this was what i wanted mm -hmm. to make and i made it exactly um and i think you have to just kind of have and that's the thing that like doing the work from start to finish making a game putting it out there um will teach you real fast is if you do actually have that um passion for doing that yeah and again that sounds kind of snooty but like we're all like passionate about different things. Like I hate cooking. I can cook. Okay. I just don't really enjoy doing it. Um, so I'm never going to like come up with a complex recipe and try to make it. My wife will, cause you'll see something and like, Oh, that looks like it would be fun to make. Like she enjoys the process of it. Um, and you have to have that for anything like this, especially if you're going to sit at the keyboard for like 40, 50, 80 hours to work on this thing, whatever, you know, some people work fast, some people don't, but uh, whether you have the passion to just make things and repeat this process. And at some point, like even the crabby parts of the process, you start sort of internalizing like, okay, there's a pleasure in like doing them and grinding them out, and being done with them. You know, like I don't enjoy making covers or marking blurbs, but there's a pleasure in like having done them and they're finished. That you complete, I mean? that, that completing stuff is definitely mm -hmm. a, you get a you get a true sense of accomplishment when you do it for yourself. Like yeah. I, I, when you have something that is the way you envisioned it, and it's going, regardless of actually the outcome of like how it goes, but you got over the yeah. finish line. You do get to that that repeating that enough times. I mean, that's the runner's high, right? Like you get to. Yeah, yeah. It's it's the reason why people run their first marathon and then they start running like hundreds <laughs> of marathons a year, and you're like, how does anyone yeah, yeah, yeah. do that? And it's like, well, no, they <laughs> they now know it's possible. They now know what their limit mm -hmm. is, and they want to get yeah. there again because they get to, they get to feel that like that fulfillment. That's really cool. Oh, well, yeah, thanks, absolutely. man. This is yeah. this has been uh, very enlightening. I hope people are are suitably yeah. educated on what it takes to do this. If I may throw in one final anecdote, because I think you and your audience might appreciate it. Um, sure. But ever since the uh, Five Men Normandy book, I have one absolute unfailing ritual. Whenever I finish a book, it goes on Wargame Vault and the emails go out. And that is that I put on Rhapsody's uh, Dawn of Victory album and listen to it start to finish. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. You have like you have like your moment, your like victory lap basically that you do uh, while you put the emails out. That's fantastic. So. You know what? That is that is a good point though. I think you find you find your rituals because uh -huh. they they are they are the personalized touch that 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 allows you to complete like doing this and also yes. to like stand back from it all and see see where your success every once in a while you kind of have to i have to well, i have to kind of walk around the studio now and be like holy shit 
the last eight months I've been white knuckling my entire life, but like, look where I am now and look who I'm talking yeah, yeah, to yeah. and look, look at how, look at how great that is when you mm -hmm. have those moments. And I, my ritual now is when I come in here in the morning is I turn all the lights on, I put music on, I set up the cameras and I just sit and like write for like five minutes. And that, mm -hmm. that like sets, it sets the tone of like, I could never have done this eight months ago. <laughs> you know, like yeah, you yeah, get yeah. to like, appre you get to appreciate the milestones yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. And it's okay to like revel in that a little bit, you know, Absolutely. like that's, that's fuel. That's you know. It's a that fights the doing, that fights the imposter syndrome. Yeah, it fights the god the, scre <laughs> the screaming rats in our brains that tell us we're failures and that no one loves us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, listen, guys, you can all check out Ivan's games on Drive Through RPG. I will link uh, the Nordic Weasel Games um, site there, and uh, there's like there is literally something for everybody. There is historical games, science fiction games, fantasy games, uh, journaling games, solo games, head to head games. You have a vast library of games right now to check out. Um, and if you're looking for stuff in hardcover there's the two wonderful modifius editions thanks to chris modifius of five leagues of the borderlands and the uh, lovely uh, five parsecs from home and you can check those out on modifius's site i think they're also you can get this edition in digital if you want on drive through rpg and then there's yes. also amazon i believe they sell them as well well thanks so much for doing this dude i hope we get more people to to end up where you are where you've you've managed yeah. to make it go this is a living because that's such an accomplishment you should be so proud of what you've done and uh I'm, I'm so excited i can't wait for you to come back and tell me about the next thing you made that's gonna blow my mind <laughs> all right well all right. thanks for having me and uh, it was a great chat all right bye everybody sweet we did it hey hey <laughs> so Thanks so much for watching another Inside Tabletop. You can check out all of Ivan's games on War Games Vault under the label for Nordic Weasel Games. Uh, you'll be able to check out another Inside Tabletop next week as I sit down with Mike Hutchinson from Gaslands uh, fame and, of course, Planet Smasher Games. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Have a good one.